Well, many of us have so much to be thankful for, uh, especially for family blessings. I was fortunate to be brought up in a very devout Christian home by God-fearing parents. As you know, my father was a Baptist preacher, as were my great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather. If you've seen that picture of the seven West brothers in my office, uh, that's my great-great-grandfather. His six brothers, all seven, were Baptist preachers. I did not even know about them until a year or two back. But even going back, my great-great-grandfather's grandfather and great-grandfather were Baptist preachers back in Virginia. And I'm proud of that heritage. I thank God for that, that uh, they were faithful to pass their faith on from generation to generation. Five of my uncles were Baptist preachers. I got four cousin preachers. I got a couple that are married to preachers. And uh, one uncle was a deacon. There's always a black sheep in the family. It, you know, all families have them. But uh, let's think about the family tonight. The family was the first institution that God ordained. He brought Eve together, established the first home. It was established before sin entered the world, remember? And sin brought about some changes in the home. You know, before sin, Adam and Eve had a perfect marriage, and only one in history. They had a perfect marriage, but when sin came along, what happened? Well, Adam blamed Eve. Remember, he said, Lord, is that woman you gave me? It's her fault. Eve blamed the serpent. Now, what do we say about the serpent? He didn't have a leg to stand on. He didn't have anybody to blame. But think about this. Jesus not only came to reconcile us back unto God, but he has come to reconcile husbands and wives, to reconcile parents and children. See, the secret to a happy home is making the Lord Jesus the center of that home. Isn't it wonderful when everybody in the family has accepted Christ as Savior? How many here can testify by the uplifted hand that everybody in your family is saved and on their way to heaven. Would you raise your hand, please? All right, there's a few of you. You can testify to that. I mean, all my aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody in my family professed faith in Jesus Christ. I, I didn't know what it was like to have a lost family member, a lost loved one. And I belong to a very fortunate family. Some of you had the same testimony. What I want to do tonight, I want us to look at three families in the Bible. And in these three families, we're going to find three family plans. You know, a lot of these businesses, they have a family plan, uh, maybe insurance or different things. They've got their family plan. Well, we see the family plan in the Bible. I want to start off with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 as a, a text verse. There Paul says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. What's an infidel? It's an unbeliever. He's worse than an unbeliever. Now, we look at this and we realize that the primary responsibility in the family is the husband and the father. He's to be the protector and provider of the home. And uh, not only providing a roof over their heads and, and food on the table, he's also responsible for the spiritual realm of his family. He's to be the spiritual leader in the home. And as goes dad, often goes the family. And we're going to see that in three examples. Now, first of all, if you want to go to Acts chapter 16... The first family we're going to look at tonight is a family that was going to heaven on the family plan. And I hope that's the family plan you're on. Going to heaven on the family plan. Look at this in Acts chapter 16. You know the story about how Paul and Silas were in Philippi and a great revival was going along. People were getting saved and, and uh, things were going well. And then they got arrested and thrown into jail for preaching the gospel. And we take up with verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, 
so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. Everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, you wouldn't think a guard would be sleeping here, but seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for all here. He called for a light and sprang in, and he came trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Evidently he heard Paul preaching to his fellow prisoners and telling about the gospel and Jesus Christ. He knew enough about, uh, they talked about being saved, having your sins forgiven, having eternal life. So he says, Sirs, what about me? Can I be saved? They said in verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And, notice this, and thy house. Talking about his household, his family. They spake unto him the word of the Lord, and all that were in his house. He took them the same night, washed their stripes, was baptized, he and all his straightway. All his family. They got saved on the family plan. You see that? And they rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now, I love this story because he takes the preachers home. He gets saved. He says, hey, I've got a, a wife and kids. Would y'all come home with me and I'll take care of you. And I want you to share this with my family. I want them to get saved. That's a good sign of salvation when you start carrying it. Others in your family and among your friends also get saved. Amen. You want others to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. When dad gets saved, you no, know, God gets a lot of mileage out of that. God can do wonders with a family when dad gets right. It's wonderful to see mom get right with God. It's wonderful to see the kids get saved. But bless your heart, it's a real blessing when dad gets saved and takes the lead in that home. How many families today would be wonderfully transformed if only dad would get born again? How many? First thing the flipping jailer wanted to do was take these preachers home so that his family would get saved. Don't you want to see your family members get saved? You know what amazes me? I hear people talking about having lost loved ones, maybe lost grown children. And I say, well, would you like for me to go over there and, and talk to them and witness to them? And I've had people say, well, oh, no, preacher, no. No, that would, that would upset them. We don't want to upset them. I thought, oh, of course, what was I thinking? Just let them die and go to hell. We certainly don't want to upset them. Don't you think they're going to be upset when they wake up in hell and realize their saved family members didn't care enough to send the preacher over to talk to them? I don't, I don't understand that kind of thinking, to be honest with you. You should be bugging us to death. Go talk to my lost loved ones. Amen. Doesn't happen, though, does it, man? I can't understand it. Is your family on the family plan that's going to heaven? See, we're talking about the Philippian family. And second, it's a phenomenal family. That word phenomenal means remarkable, extraordinary. The spiritual needs of your children and grandchildren, that, that ought to be the most important thing to you. Hey, no dad is ready for the Lord to come as long as he's got children that are not saved and serving the Lord. No blood-washed, born-again dad wants to leave his children behind when the Lord comes. I remember preaching a revival meeting. My good friend Lynn Baxter was the pastor. It was over in Jacksonville, Arkansas. And... Uh, we were both young preachers then. He had a daughter about 12 years old. 
at first night, we were talking, and he said, Brother Dwight, he said, listen, I've got a 12-year-old daughter who's not been saved yet. He said, I've really been praying and fasting that she gets saved during this revival meeting. Would you join with me in praying for her salvation? I said, you bet I will. I don't remember which night it was, but one night after, we, after I preached, we gave the invitation, and here comes that 12-year-old daughter down the aisle and told her daddy she was ready to get saved. Brother Baxter had a shouting spell. He cut loose and shouted all over that place. Then he got some of the older ladies. Oh, they got excited, and they started shouting. You ever been in a service like that? We ought to get our shout back, amen? We ought to get our shout back. If seeing your, saved gets, if seeing your children get saved doesn't want you to shout, then I don't know what will. What a great privilege and honor it is to see our children come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's where it's supposed to be. Most children are raised in a good, godly, Christ-honoring home will usually get saved early on. That's a wonderful family plan that we need to follow. How many of you were raised in a godly home and were saved in your youth? Raise your hands for me. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Aren't you glad that, that you came to know the Lord early? You could use your whole life to serve Him and follow Him. Thank God for good Christian parents who made sure that we knew Christ as Savior early on. Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. It's about the family circle. Will your circle be unbroken in heaven? Are there going to be some missing that didn't make it? And I know some of you are doing everything you can to win your lost loved ones to the Lord, but just don't give up. Keep praying and keep witnessing until they come to know Christ as Savior. Now, I'm not saying by going to heaven on the family plan that children and grandchildren can go just because their parents were saved. Now, you got to get saved too. The children must repent. And trust in Jesus Christ themselves. You don't go to heaven on mama's coattails. Amen. But it's more likely to happen when you're raised in a good Christian home that exalts Jesus Christ and faithfully attends church service. Let's look at a second family. Let's go back to Genesis 19. Let's look at the family of Lot. Here was a family going into heathenism on the family plan. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. He was a saved man according to 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. Because there it says that when God destroyed Sodom, he delivered just Lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, reading Genesis, you would not guess he was a saved man. We, we really wouldn't know that, but Peter tells us he was. He was a just man, which meant he was justified in the eyes of God. He was righteous in the sense that he had the imputed righteousness of the Lord upon him. He was a saved man. But what about his family? There came a time when Lot made a bad decision. Lot decided to separate from his godly uncle Abraham and move his family into the city of Sodom. If you read it, you remember reading, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Then later on we find him living in Sodom. He moved his family into a very wicked city. And he prospered there materially. And it seems like he is more concerned with building up a business than in building a godly home. Hey, he's like a lot of men today who do not really take the lead in the home to make sure their children and their family are serving and worshiping the Lord. They don't do that. They don't think that's important. Now, they're important. they think it's important to make sure the kids have all the things the world has to offer but not all the things the Lord has to offer. Right? 
He's like a lot of men today. Lot was. A lot of men today, they leave it up to the wife to take the kids to church. They leave it up to the wife to have family devotions at home. Now, I thank God for good, faithful mothers who will do that. But it's the man's responsibility. Come on, men. Now, some children don't even have a godly mother to take them to church. Some depend upon grandparents to do that. Some depend upon a, a bus ministry to pick them up and bring them so they can hear the Word of God. Parents are not concerned about it. Then there's those who they decide that we should go to church, and they're going to let the kids decide which church to go to. Is that wise? What kind of church are the kids going to pick? The one's got the climbing wall. It's got all the fun things. They're going to look for the fun church. They're not concerned about doctrine. Amen. Kids aren't concerned about whether the church is doctrinally correct. They'll go to the fun church. Parents, that's not a decision kids need to make. Come on. You need to make sure that they're in a Bible-centered church that's going to teach and preach the truth of God's Word. It concerns me that sometimes men will leave a good Bible church and, and move off for a job opportunity and not even consider, is there a good church there for my family? I mean, they're like, years ago, we had a guy, some of y'all remember Butch Higginbotham? He was a, our youth director way back when. He uh, managed a lumber yard here in Tulsa. They were going to transfer him somewhere else. He said, no, I don't want to go. They said, well, you don't have any choice. You've got to go. He said, no, I don't got to do nothing. He said, I like it here. We've got a good church. I've got my kids in a good Bible church. I don't want to leave it. So you have to. He said, no, I don't. I can find another job. And he did. He quit and went and found another job. He wasn't going to let the company decide where his family is going to live. I think that's pretty wise, to be honest. Companies will move you all over the country. They don't care. But, Dad, you better care that you've got your family in a place where they can find a church that will raise your children to nurture and admonition of the Lord. So lots going into heathenism. On the family plan. He moves his family into wicked Sodom. You know what Sodom was famous for? More concerned about money than about spiritual things. I'm talking about these kids. I, I thank God for our bus ministry. I thank God we've got people that care enough about these children to make sure that they're in church and learn how to be saved. Appreciate that. But let me say something, parents. It's good to have your kids in church every Sunday, and y'all too. Every Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday night. That's not enough. You better make sure you're also teaching them at home. Teach them at home. Have devotionals in the home. And parents, be a good example for them to follow. Amen? Christian home ought to be a spiritual place. Where the children receive spiritual training. Kids need godly parents who live by this book. Don't say one thing and do another. Then notice the failure of Lot. Lot made another bad mistake. Besides moving his family to Sodom, he married off some of his daughters to lost Sodomites. You know, it breaks my heart to see our young people grow up and marry lost people, get out of church. Oh, they think they'll get that lost mate saved after they get married. But listen, if you can't do it before the wedding, you probably won't afterwards. It disturbs me when parents don't seem to care that their children are marrying unsaved people. I mean, I can warn them about this. And they get upset with me for just bringing it up. 
And they say, but Brother Wes, he's a good boy. And he has a good job. Comes from a respectable family. Yes, but he's an infidel. Your daughter doesn't need to marry an infidel. I had one preacher friend that got mad because I refused to do his daughter's wedding because she was going to marry an infidel. It's okay with him. I said, no, I'm not going to have a party in it. I will not knowingly marry a believer to an unbeliever. Somebody else did and didn't last long. They split up. They're unequally yoked together. Listen to what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's pretty plain, isn't it? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Lot's lost sons-in-law had no respect for him and his beliefs, did they? I mean, they only mocked him when he tried to warn them of coming divine judgment. And Lot found out just how bad a job he had done in raising his children. He was a worldly backslider who let his own kids and grandkids die and go to hell. Family sure getting messed up on this family plan. Mom and dad not raising their children like they should. Going to heathenism on the family plan. Let's look at one other. If you go to Luke chapter 16 with me. There's a story of the rich man and Lazarus that Jesus tells us about. It says the rich man died and went to hell. In hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. Here's a family going to hell on the family plan. It's sad there are so many families today that are going to hell on the family plan. They're all going. They're all unbelievers. By the way, hell's a real place. Hell is hot, and those who go there will never get out. There's no party going on there. Nobody's having fun there. It's a place of torment. The rich man discovered that. He discovered there's no hope for him to ever get out of there. And he asked that somebody would go back and warn his lost brothers. Verse 27. He said, I pray thee therefore, Father, talking to Abraham, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. He wanted Lazarus to go back. I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He had five lost brothers. He didn't want them to come down there and party with him, did he? That makes me mad. Oh, yeah, I'll go to hell, but we'll just have a big party. No party there. There's no friendship there. Everybody there hates everybody else there. There's nothing but hate in hell. They hate God. They hate Jesus Christ. They hate everybody down there. No party. It's a horrible place to be, it's a place of torment. We're trying to warn you, avoid that place. Jesus died so that you would not have to go there. It's not God's will that any should perish. How sad it is to see folks going to hell on a family plan. A rich man's family evidently didn't go to church. Had six sons. They could have packed a few, couldn't they? Six sons. Parents probably made sure that they had everything the world could offer. Made sure that they had all the fine clothes and that they could play sports and be involved in school activities and go on vacation to Disney World. Everything that worldly parents think is so important. They just didn't thank God 
or church was important. They didn't raise their kids that way. Now they're going to all die and go to hell. Married couples once contacted by members of a church, invited to Sunday school and church. This is a record of their responses down through the years. As these people would go back and go back time and time again to try to encourage this family to come to church. First call, yeah, we're going to start the church as soon as the baby gets old enough to behave. Year later, yes, we promise, but the baby's still at that age where she cries a lot. She gets older, we'll start coming to church. Three years later, I know you think we're awful, but our little Judy doesn't want to go to church. We hate to make her go. Eleven years later, I'm glad you came by. Could you talk with Judy? She's running with the wrong crowd, getting into trouble. Could the church provide some activities for her church or her age group? Two years later, well, Judy had to get married because she got pregnant. They're so young. He's not a Christian. We hope it'll work out. Five years later. But well, Judy finally married a man that could give her the better things in life. It's her third husband, but we hope this one works out. You know, it just seems to me the church failed her somewhere along the way. Who failed her? What in the church? It was mom and dad. Mom and dad. So easy to blame others, isn't it? You see this man's lost brothers? And in closing, think about the many lost blessings involved here. It's so sad to see families that have no interest in God, no interest in church. All around us, we've got infidel parents raising infidel children who will raise infidel grandchildren. Somebody needs to break a family curse of unbelief. I heard about a rancher down in Texas. This old boy is tough as nails. He had four sons that he raised to take over the ranch and run it for him. He was an infidel, lived an ungodly life. But in his 70s, he finally got saved. Had some friends that worked with him for a number of years and finally were able to lead this man to, to the Lord. And he's concerned about his family getting saved, like the Philippian jailer. His four sons were middle-aged by this time. And he thought, well, I'll just call them in one at a time and I'll tell them what happened and how that they need to trust in Christ and be saved also. When he discovered he was like Lot, his sons didn't want to hear it. They had got religion, but that's not what they were interested in. None of them was willing to hear him or be saved. True story, this man lived long enough to bury all four sons. They all four died as unbelievers. He waited too late to try to reach his sons. How tragic. It's tragic there are families today all around us that are going to hell on the family plan. I wish more parents could see the importance of raising their children to know the Lord. Let me ask you tonight, who's fa who, which family plan are you following? We can give thanks for family blessings when we're all going to heaven on the family plan. I thank God that I had faithful parents. Can your children thank God for you? If you still got children at home, these are important years. Keep them in church. Live the right life in front of them so that when they grow up, they can thank God for you, for your faithfulness in raising them and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Are you right with God? Are you and your family going to heaven on the family plan? Is the Lord Jesus the center of your home? Some of you may have been raised in a good Christian home, but you're not giving your children the same kind of upbringing you had. 
Say, Brother Wes, I'm not as good a Christian parent as my parents were. Maybe you need to get right tonight. Maybe you need to change some of your priorities. Start leading your family the right way. I know many have good intentions. They're going to get, I talk to them. Oh yeah, Brother Wes, we're going to get in church and be faithful someday. When our schooling's done, when I get my business going well, when the children get older, and on and on it goes. One excuse after another. Do you need to get right with God tonight for your family's sake?